Hi there, I'm Jim Zirin. Welcome back to more conversations. Wherever I go, I'm frequently asked the question, is there a case for impeachment against President Donald Trump? With us is political historian Alan J. Lichtman, a distinguished professor at American University in Washington. Professor Lichtman is popularly known as the prediction professor. Using a model he developed called the Keys to the White House, our guests accurately predicted the victor in seven of the last nine presidential elections, including the victory of President Trump. He's the author of a fascinating book entitled The Case for Impeachment, where he predicts that President Trump will be impeached before the end of his term. And we're pleased to welcome him to the program to tell us why he thinks so. Now, Alan, uh, has anything happened uh, since you wrote the book in April 2017 uh, that uh, influences uh, your view at all that Trump will be impeached before the end of his term? Oh, nothing much has happened <laughs> in the last year, as we know. In fact, of course, I made my prediction for the first time that Trump would likely be impeached. At the same time, I predicted he'd be elected president in the Washington Post in September of 2016. So I was able to foresee, as I wrote in my book, his many vulnerabilities, the most vulnerable person ever to be elected in terms of impeachment. And I outlined a number of areas, all of which seem, based on what's happened in the last year, to be coming, coming to pass. One of my chapters is, of course, on the Russia connection and how, during the campaign, he, his team was likely coordinating with the Russians to rig our elections. Another chapter on Trump's war against w women. Another chapter on his conflicts of interest, his violation of the emoluments clause of the Constitution, which says, without the permission of Congress, you can't take anything of value from a foreign power or their agents. And he's doing that every day. Every single day. And there's a lawsuit that one of the judges... Well, more than one. Yeah, but the one that I'm following is the one in my home state of Maryland, where Judge Peter Massetti said that lawsuit can now go forward, a federal judge. And in the updated version of the case for impeachment, which we have right here, I also pointed out his vulnerability on obstruction of justice. So much of what I saw a year and more ago Sadly, I'm not rooting for this, but sadly is coming to pass. Well, you've stated a, a lot of possible grounds and a lot of possibilities. Uh, when you predicted Trump's victory, uh, he sent you a letter, didn't he? He sure did. Well, and he, what did he say? You know, I, I've predicted you know, <laughs> seven or eight victories since 1984. Trump's a showman, and he's the first one to ever send me a note. And he said, right on my Washington Post interview, you know, it shows he doesn't always hate the Washington Post. And it says, congrats, Professor, good call, signed in that, you know, uh, sharpie, big, bold Donald J. Trump. Now, did he send you a similar letter when your book came out, The Case for Impeachment, and he said, good call, Professor? I'm, I'm sure he didn't read my book. <laughs> he but, didn't read your book. <laughs> I, I've been waiting for him to tweet about it, you know. Donald, if you're listening, attack me, hit me, tweet me, tell me why I'm wrong. Well, let me uh, push you a little bit on sure. the grounds. Maybe first we ought to talk about the procedure. It's, it's pretty straightforward yep. in the Constitution. Uh, the House votes a bill of impeachment, which is the accusation, and then two-thirds of the Senate after a trial must uh, agree that the president should be removed from office, and then uh, he's removed from office. It's uh, full stop. Uh, now... Uh, we have a Republican House. Um, we may not have a Republican House after the uh, <laughs> November 2018 election, but with a Republican House, is it likely uh, that they'll vote out a bill of impeachment? Probably not, but let me back up for a second and just make it clear that impeachment is not a strictly legal process. If it were so, the framers would have put it in the courts. Instead, as you point out, they put it in two political bodies. The House charges, the Senate tries and disposes. And as Alexander Hamilton pointed out, there doesn't have to be a formal indictable crime to have an impeachment, only a serious abuse of power that threatens the nation, which may or may not be. 
Well, the Constitution says crime. high crimes and misdemeanors. It actually says uh, bribery, uh, treason. Those other are specific, high, right? High crimes and misdemeanors. Right. Now, and what what is meant by high crimes? Does that mean a crime by a highly placed public official, or does it mean a particularly aggravated crime? Nobody knows. Gerald Ford once said. High crimes and misdemeanors are whatever the House of Representatives decides they are at any given moment. Now, that's a little bit of hyperbole, but there's some truth to it because the framers never defined the meaning of high crimes and misdemeanors, although Hamilton, the great expositor of the Constitution, did say it was a serious abuse of presidential power that threatens society itself. That's a, as good a definition as we're going to get. And let me also say, people look at impeachment as this catastrophic event. Not at all. The framers advisedly put impeachment into the Constitution as an orderly, legal, peaceful process for dealing with a rogue leader, as opposed to the way rogue leaders were dealt with in their own time in the 18th century by assassination or revolution. Now, to get to your question, it is at the discretion of the House, which has the sole authority to impeach. No appeal from it to the courts. Is it likely that a Republican House would charge the president with articles of impeachment? No. Does the Constitution say it can only be uh, offenses that occur while he's in office? Absolutely not. Now, you know, Alan Dershowitz, professor at Harvard Law School emeritus, uh, disagrees with you. He says uh, it has to be an abuse of presidential power. Uh, so what is the basis uh, for uh, your interpretation that it could be something that goes back many years, uh, something that uh, might be indictable or might not be indictable, but the whole kitchen sink that might be poured into a bill of impeachment? Right. I have great respect for Professor Dershowitz, but I have to say virtually everything he's had to say <laughs> about the case for impeachment has been flatly wrong. As I point out in, in the book, The Case for Impeachment, there is nothing in the Constitution, in the only document that really defines impeachment, that limits the time frame. Under Dershowitz's strange interpretation, you could be elected president by hiring the mafia to organize a hit against your opponent. It's only discovered after your already installed in office, and Alan Dershowitz would say, you can't be impeached for that because it occurred prior to the presidency. Well, That's I, nonsense. I think most constitutional lawyers would agree that if there was wrongdoing that uh, facilitated the president's attaining office, that that might be an impeachable offense. But uh, can they go back to uh, the 1970s when uh, Trump discriminated against blacks and minorities in housing? Can they go back? <laughs> 10 years when he had uh, relationships with women that might be questioned. Uh, how far back do you go and, and what do you charge him with? Well, or there's is the there's, sky there's, the limit. There's no limitation on how far back you would go. But I point out in the case for impeachment that the most reasonable thing that uh, I might even persuade Alan Dershowitz to agree with me is if he was involved in, in any way manipulating the 2016 election. That directly implicates his presidency in fundamental ways. Obviously, it could have affected his election, but more fundamentally, it could make him a compromised president. That is, if in fact he or even his team was coordinating with the Russians, they would obviously have something on him. And it could explain his very strange behavior, where he's probably the only Democratic leader never to lay a glove on Vladimir Putin. So certainly any involvement on Trump's part in uh, coordinating a manipulation of our election, in my view, would clearly be an impeachable offense because it directly affects the presidency itself. Let me uh, give you a hypothetical. <laughs> uh, Alan Lickman decides he wants to run for president on the Democratic ticket. And uh, he says, uh, and a reporter says to him, well, what do you think about our relationship with Russia? And uh, you say, I'll get back to you. And you think about it and you say, well, you know, we've had bad relationships with Russia. We had bad relationships under Obama. 
uh, let's try to reset that relationship. And uh, maybe my position is uh, we ought to try to uh, have a better relationship with Russia because uh, they're going to be very necessary in establishing a global order. Is there anything wrong with that? Absolutely not. But if I'm saying that because Vladimir Putin has compromising information on me because I was involved with him in a plot to destroy American democracy, then there would be a lot wrong with it. Now you're putting in additional facts. Of or, course. Or, or if you've been bribed to take that position. Exactly. Now, the bribery implicates uh, another area which has been questioned, which are uh, Trump's financial dealings before he took office, the possibility of money laundering, uh, the possibility of other irregularities. Uh, would they be relevant to uh, a bill of impeachment? Absolutely. Because, again, if he was involved in illegal money laundering activities, that would compromise his presidency. I think there might be an argument to be made, and I'm not going to get into it, that something that happened in the past that has no relationship to the presidency itself, say something like housing discrimination in the 1970s, but money laundering, coordinating a plot with the Russians to destroy our democracy, those directly implicate the presidency and, in my view, clearly could constitute articles of impeachment. But those aren't the only possible articles. I think there are others. I think he's clearly been violating the Emoluments Clause of the Constitution, which says, without the permission of Congress, you can't take anything of value from a foreign power. He hasn't divested his far-flung interests. He has interests all over the world which are greatly affected by decisions made by foreign powers, decisions about taxes, decisions about environmental easements, decisions about uh, what he could build. All of these decisions made by foreign powers could directly benefit Trump financially and therefore blatantly violate the Emoluments Clause. So using his influence with China so his daughter could get a trademark where she wasn't able to get a trademark uh, before he took office, that would be an example. Clearly. But he himself got trademarks from China that were suddenly expedited once he got elected president and were even speeded up while during the campaign. Clearly, those are emoluments from foreign powers that are prohibited under the Constitution, and the remedy is impeachment. That might uh, uh, well be so, but uh, has any uh, president uh, ever been impeached uh, under the Emoluments Clause? No, because pri prior presidents have taken appropriate safeguards in terms of divestments or blind trusts to make sure that they don't run afoul of the Emoluments Clause. Donald Trump is the first modern president to kind of, you know, put his thumb in the eye of the Constitution and said, I'm still going to profit. Not disclose my tax returns. And not disclose my tax returns. I'm still going to profit from all of my foreign enterprises. And by the way, very few people know this. There's also a domestic emoluments clause, which says as president, the only thing of value you could take from the federal government or any state governments is your salary. And there's certainly evidence that Donald Trump has taken money in, for example, from public state pension funds. Or certainly a domestic bribery would be a grounds for impeachment. Well, any kind of bribery. We're not even no, talking about bribery expressly here. expressly mentions bribery. Well, we may be because uh, there was a time when Trump was running out of money. And uh, miraculously, he seemed to find money at Deutsche Bank, which had dealings with the Russians, or from other sources that we don't know about. Uh, and haven't been disclosed. They were the subject of uh, the Steele dossier, but it hasn't been disclosed yet. So if he got money uh, from the Russians, that might be uh, uh, designed to influence him and might sure. be corrupt and might be bribery. That, you know, one of the things that strikes me is just how corrupt the entire administration is, you know, from the top on down. You know, we just saw this guy, Scott Pruitt, the head of the EPA, who wants to roll back virtually every environmental protection we have, getting this sweetheart deal for 50 bucks a night for a swanky condo a block from the Capitol. Not only that, he only has to pay on the nights he's there. So in six months, he's paid about $6,000. I know real estate on Capitol Hill, and that's, you know, maybe 
a tiny fraction of what that deal is worth. Well, or the rates in the, uh, the Trump International Hotel in Washington went up as yep. soon as he was elected president. It, 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 it all stinks. And There's just so much corruption in here. Yes. Not to speak of, you know, his son-in-law apparently using his position in the White House to try to get financing for his underwater properties in New York. So I think in terms of the case for impeachment, as I've written it in the revised edition, the most likely articles of impeachment are conspiracy against the United States by conspiring with the Russians to rig the election. He, everyone keeps yelling, including your friend Mr. Dershowitz, collusion is no crime. Well, conspiracy against the United States is one of the crimes charged against uh, Paul Manafort, not to mention violating the laws against aiding and abetting computer hacking or getting something of value from foreign parties. Well, That's number one. Conspiracy to defraud the United States right. is in the uh, statute book. Absolutely. And Paul Manafort was charged with it. So that's number one. But what is the evidence? Is there any uh, direct evidence that Trump sat down with Putin or some other Russian and said, uh, let's rig the election? There's plenty of evidence that, and remember, we don't know what Mueller knows. Every time Mueller files an indictment, all kinds of new things come out. So I think we know about 10% of what Mueller knows in this. But even from what we publicly know, top level members of his campaign, including his son and including his son-in-law, were meeting and communicating with Russian agents. And by the way, you know as well as I that Russian agents don't come wearing uniforms. You know, they use cutouts. They use people who give them some kind of plausible deniability. And we know- Well, in this that, case, it was a woman wearing a dress. Exactly. <laughs> Or, you know, an ex-military uh, intelligence officer says, I'm retired, you know, I have no con. come on. So we know top-level members of the campaign were in contact with uh, cutouts for Russian intelligence. And that's just what's publicly known. Well, and they offered to uh, give them dirt on Hillary Clinton. On Hillary Clinton. Clinton. If that isn't a conspiracy, I, I don't know what now, is. We also and they lied about it repeatedly. We Both all, Don Jr. and Trump himself. Yeah. So the circumstantial evidence that uh, this occurred is uh, the cover-up and the lying about it yes. and all the rest. It's very Nixonian. Just like Nixon. First, deny it all. What? No contacts with the Russians. And then lie about it. And then when you're caught, say, oh, these contacts were all innocuous anyway. Just like Watergate was nothing more than a third-rate burglary. I mean, the cover-up parallels Watergate almost exactly. But I would not say that the cover-up is worse than the crime. The crime, if it exists, of conspiracy against the United States to undermine an election is incredibly serious. So those are two possible charges. What about the firing of Jim Comey? Does that That's all part anything? of the obstruction of justice. There's so much involved well, there. Can you charge a president with obstruction of justice for doing something that he's lawfully uh, authorized and entitled to do under the Constitution? Uh, yes, if it's done for a corrupt purpose. But so what about, uh, suppose he pardoned uh, his son, his son-in-law? Uh, that would be part of it if he did it for a corrupt. But it's not just the firing of Comey. That's one piece of about 10 items, including making up this false story about the Trump Tower meeting with the Russians in June of 2016, claiming, oh, this was just about adoptions, not about dirt on Hillary Clinton. And what about pressuring members of Congress, the FBI, intelligence chiefs to manipulate the investigation into the Russia connection? That's one of the things that Richard Nixon was charged with on obstruction of justice. So those are two possible charges. The emoluments clause is a third possible charge. And of course, bribery, if in fact he is, and I have no evidence of this one way or the other, that's all not been revealed yet by Mueller, if it does exist, possible financial uh, ties to the Russians or you know mafia-connected figures. But at this point, I'm only speculating but it does look like Mueller is examining that issue. What about paying off a, uh, a woman or women uh, okay. not to disclose information on the eve of an election or causing them to be paid off? Is that an impeachable offense? Probably not enough of an offense, but it, it, again, it could become part of 
another charge. Well, doesn't that subvert the democratic process? Aren't the people entitled to know both favorable and un un unfavorable information? I think so, but that alone probably is not severe enough for an impeachable offense. I think it would be part of a broader uh, obstruction defense. But there's another element to it, and that's, of course, violation of the campaign finance laws. You know, you, 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 if it's Michael Cohen alone, and I don't believe that for a second, and Trump knew nothing about it, you can't give $130,000 to a campaign. And if it was Donald Trump, you have to report it. He could give as much as he wants to his own campaign. Well, he denies he knew anything about it. Yeah, but who knows? Then That's he, what I'm saying. Then he entered the lawsuit and right. said he was the third-party beneficiary of the contract. Either way, you're violating the law. Either Michael Cohen made an illegal campaign contribution or Donald Trump didn't report a campaign contribution, and that's serious. What else do you have on him? I mean, you've made some extravagant charges. You said he's committed a crime against humanity because uh, he uh, uh, walked out of the Paris uh, Climate Accord. Well, it's much more than that, as I point mm. out in the case for impeachment. And Scott Pruitt has proven to be right every day in that he seems to be completely in the pocket of the fossil fuel industry, which is the greatest opponent of the notion that our planet is suffering from catastrophic climate change. This is the most controversial thing I say in the case for impeachment. And by the way, I make it very clear that I am not saying we should impeach Donald Trump because we don't agree with his policies or don't like his style. In terms of committing a crime against humanity, my argument is you would have to prove that he is deliberately and knowingly endangering the well-being and even the survival of humanity. I'll give you a quote. This quote was from 2009 and it said, unless we take strong action against climate change, the science is irrefutable that the consequences will be catastrophic for humanity and the planet. Didn't Trump himself sign a letter? That's right. This well, is tell us Trump about the letter. Himself. This is a letter to Barack Obama on the eve of, I think it was the Copenhagen Climate Conference saying, we, th this is a crisis. The survival of humanity is at stake unless we take strong action against climate change. It was a businessman's letter signed by Donald Trump, Donald Trump Jr., Eric Trump, and Ivanka Trump. What has changed in the last eight years? Ivanka married Jared Kushner. Right, and Donald <laughs> Trump became a politician. The science hasn't changed, it's gotten stronger. The threat hasn't abated, it's gotten worse. And by the way, Although it doesn't have jurisdiction over the U.S., this is still important in terms of the big picture. The International Criminal Court has now prioritized crimes against the environment as a kind of genocide. You know, we think of genocide as, you know, mass murder, violence, but destroying the environment and exposing us to catastrophic climate change is just as devastating. And there have been lawsuits won around the world against governments on catastrophic climate change, and there is a pending lawsuit, the children's lawsuit, here in the United States. So I think this is truly serious, and I also think it's corrupt. Now, there's another thing I hear all the time, and that is, uh, yeah, he's committed impeachable offenses, he's a lousy president, uh, we ought to get rid of him, but he'd be terrible for the country, just terrible for the country. Would it be terrible or would it be cleansing? Wrong. As I said... And we'd get Mike Pence, who might be worse. Well, that's another issue. But let me just say in terms of being terrible for the country. As I pointed out, the framers did not look at impeachment as catastrophic, but a perfectly legal and orderly process for dealing with a rogue president. And they understood better than we do the fallibility of human beings. Secondly, if you look at the history of impeachment, they have generally been good, not bad for the country. First president to be impeached... Andrew Johnson in 1868. He was acquitted, but the impeachment was good for the country because it moderated Andrew Johnson's bitter opposition to rights for the newly freed slaves. Fast forward to Richard Nixon. He wasn't impeached by the full House, only by the House Judiciary Committee because he resigned, and obviously that impeachment process and resignation was good for the country because it removed a president who was a threat to our democracy. Finally, Bill Clinton, everybody was saying, oh, woe is us, this is going to destroy the presidency. And as we know, 
the presidency emerged stronger than ever from the impeachment of Bill Clinton. And so catastrophic consequences have not followed. So it's alive. It might not be well. So I have a question for you, Mr. Prediction Professor. Oh, my goodness. And will Donald Trump be impeached? Yes. Now, you asked me very early on, I didn't give you the full answer, would a Republican House impeach the president? Under ordinary circumstances, no. But Donald Trump has only one leg that he's standing on right now, and that's the economy. If the economy should, you know, start to go south before the midterms, and Donald Trump looks like he's bringing down the Republican House members, then they might at least start an impeachment process. Then because they might start an impeachment process. Unfortunately, we've run out of time. Oh! It's been marvelous, absolutely marvelous. And so, Alan Lickman, thank you so much for coming by. And thank you for coming by. Tune in next week for more conversations. I'm Jim Zirin. Take care and all the best.